Welcome back to the Code Wolf. Today we're going to explore what I personally think is the best new feature in .NET 9, which is the new hybrid cache service. Caching is such a critical part of web apps that many devs often overlook, and this new service fixes and improves upon options that we've had for quite a while. Now, in order to truly understand the benefits of hybrid cache, you really do need to also understand the caching services in .NET 8 and earlier. So we'll walk through some direct comparison examples to really understand why this feature is so compelling. At the time of this recording, we're also just reaching the huge 5,000 subscriber milestone. So thanks to all of you who have supported the channel thus far. And if you haven't already, please consider clicking that subscribe button to join the Code Wolf pack. Let's get started. So for this video, I've set up this simple caching demo app. And I'll try to make this available on GitHub because setting this up is honestly kind of a pain if you're looking to compare all the different options. But at a high level, we have this slow date service, and this simulates a slow database or web service call. So maybe your app is accessing a bunch of records from a database or getting data from an external web API, and that can take a bit of time. So I've just added in this task.delay of three seconds. And for our purposes, we're returning a date time dot now uh, timestamp or a string of that. And this is important because we can use that timestamp as a reference of when that item was added to the cache and kind of compare uh, different entries. So that'll be important in a moment. But this app is really just a simple uh, minimal API in .NET 9. And so we have a few different endpoints that demonstrate the different caching options. So in .NET 8 and earlier, we had two options, which were the in-memory cache and the distributed cache but both of those have issues that we're gonna look at in a second, and those issues have been fixed and improved upon by the new hybrid cache in .NET 9. And so out in our browser, uh, you can see we have these three endpoints, and we can use these to test out um, our different endpoints. So further down in the app, um, here's where those endpoints live, so we're gonna walk through these one by one and understand how they work. So for the in-memory cache, uh, this is kind of the simplest option, the simple in-memory cache, so that'll set that up for DI or dependency injection. And then down in that endpoint, um, we can just inject that in here. So we have our I memory cache injected uh, after registering that service. And we're also injecting our slow date service um, that simulates our database call. So that's what we just looked at here. Now, the code of this method is actually pretty simple. I actually don't mind working with the I memory cache um, in terms of the code itself. So if we look at this, we have this get or create async method, and that will essentially get a cache entry or create it if it doesn't exist. And all we have to do is pass in a key to reference uh, that entry in the cache. So in this case, that's gonna be current time. And then we can pass in a factory method that generates that entry if it doesn't already exist and then pass in some options. So in this case, I'm configuring the cache to last for 10 seconds. So I'll set a breakpoint in our method here, and then we already have a breakpoint in our service. So if we go back out to the browser, I'll execute this, and this time we'll step down and do both methods, uh, and that'll simulate our three second delay. But then if we run this right away again, it's gonna jump back out to the browser. So notice that time um, it did not hit the second breakpoint because it's already cached. And so it skipped over the factory method to create the cache item again. So now when we run it again, it's going to uh, go back down into that method because the cache expired. So this is a 10 second cache. And so um, if we quickly refresh, we get the cache, but if we wait a minute, we don't. So that's how that works, but there's a couple issues with this iMemory cache. The first is that it's, well, an iMemory cache. It's not a distributed cache, and that means this is basically limited to just caching on whatever machine is running this process. So that obviously creates limitations as you're trying to scale up across multiple servers or instances. Um, another issue with this is that it does not have stampede protection. So essentially that means it doesn't handle multiple requests at once very well. So if three requests come in at the same time, all of them will execute this factory method that will set that cache entry when really just the first request should set the entry and then the second two um, would pull from the cache instead of setting again. And to simulate that, um, we can actually do something like Postman. Um, this is better for testing this than the Swagger UI interface. So if I were to quickly fire this off and then fire off the second one, so that's two requests to our memory cache endpoint, you can see we land in our method, and then we land in our date service because it's gonna generate a cache entry for us. 
But then if we click and step through this again, notice how the second time we also landed in our date service. So the second one didn't get the result of the cache. So now if we continue and we go back out to Postman, you'll see that the first response is actually a different timestamp than the second one. So essentially we cached the same item twice, but with different values. So the second request didn't just pick up the cached item from the first one, it actually overwrote it, which is not good. On larger scale apps, this can be a real problem. Now distributed cache, this is a second option we've always had. And so up here we can register um, a distributed cache and then we'll be able to inject the I distributed cache uh, implementation into our methods. But you'll notice there's actually two items here. So if I were to uncomment this, one of the issues with this service is that it doesn't provide a default uh, in memory fallback. So if you don't register an actual distributed cache service, in this case, I'm using Redis, but if I were to comment this out, now there is no memory solution. There's just this Redis one. And if that doesn't work, there isn't a fallback. Now let's go with this Redis solution for right now. So I've deployed um, an Azure cache for Redis out there and I'm pulling that in using a connection string um, in the app settings. So I'm gonna comment that out for now and stick with this actual distributed cache because this has problems of its own. So if we look at that example, uh, you'll notice this code looks a bit more complex and that's because distributed cache doesn't have a get and set in one operation. So first we actually try to get the items from the cache using our key and if that's null, well, then we go out and we get our slow date again from that service. Then we serialize it and cache it because this uh, API doesn't have built in uh, serialization. Now, in this case, I'm using a string. So you could also just use the simpler uh, set string uh, helper method here. But a lot of the time you'll be caching objects. And so in that case, you have to actually get the bytes manually. So you have to handle serializing that into a byte array. Then you have to set the cache and you pass in your options. I'm again setting the 10 second expiration. Um, now, if it did find it from the cache, then you still have to deserialize it. So there's just a lot of manual get and set and serialize and deserialize here. And I distributed cache also suffers from the same problem of stampeding, where if there's multiple requests at once, it doesn't queue those up and handle them properly which is a much bigger problem in my opinion with distributed caches because most likely you're gonna have a higher volume of traffic in a distributed app, which could make this problem worse. So let's set a breakpoint here and test this again. So if we go back out to our postman here, you can see now we're hitting the distributed cache endpoint. So if I were to send that and immediately jump to our second copy of that and send that again, well, let's step through our debugger and see what this gives us. So we'll land in the distributed cache method. I'll hit continue. We'll go into our slow date service. The second request comes in and we'll go into our slow date service and we'll say continue. And after a moment, we'll get our response back. So notice the 667 uh, at the end of here. But if we go to our other tab, it's 873. So again, these are different values because we fired off two requests. It essentially cached the same entry twice at slightly different times. So that is not great. Um, stampeding can be a major problem with caching. And there's again, no protection against that with I distributed cache. And uh, we actually have this kind of worse syntax. Uh, this can be kind of a pain to manage over and over in your app if you're doing a lot of caching. So memory cache, simple, but has issues. Distributed cache, more powerful, but also has issues. So now in .NET 9, we have this awesome caching solution, which is called hybrid cache. And the reason it's called hybrid cache is because it provides a default implementation of the in-memory caching, but it also provides the distributed cache and it fixes all the issues that we've already talked about with simplified APIs. It's really just a great solution. So you can see right here how much simpler this code is. There's almost nothing here. So we again have our key, which I'm setting as the current time. And this accepts two parameters by default. So the first is the key again. And the second is a factory method again, where we can call our get slow date async. And it'll call this method if the item doesn't exist in the cache and it needs to get that value to cache it. And this actually handles serialization for us behind the scenes or internally. And you can even configure how that serialization works, but we're not really gonna worry about that in this video. Um, but anyway, simple API. And this gets injected as a class so if we go back up to our uh, registrations here, um, you can see we have this add hybrid cache. So this registers that class for dependency injection. 
And here we can actually set an options object uh, globally. And so I'm setting a 10 second expiration again. And if you do wire up um, Stack Exchange Redis or something like this, it will automatically use uh, that Redis instance rather than using the in-memory instance, which is nice. So let's go ahead and test this out. So we've got our breakpoint there. And let's switch back to Postman. So I have one final pair of requests here. So these are to the hybrid cache endpoint. So I'll fire off the first one and then the second one real quick. And so we'll step through this and the first request will hit um, our slow date service here. So I'll hit continue. But notice that we never get a second request that hits the slow date service. That's because those requests were properly managed and the second one ended up just pulling from the cache what the first one had already um, entered in there. So if we tab back and forth here, you'll see that this time both values are exactly the same because the second request used the value that was cached by the first. So again, both of these are the hybrid cache endpoint, but they're getting the same value back. And that's exactly what we want. This fixes one of the biggest problems with caching that we've had in .NET. It's also worth noting that there's some other benefits here. So if we look at the uh, methods here on our IntelliSense, there's also the option to tag and remove by tag. And you can set and remove um, separately if you want to. So really this hybrid cache kind of provides anything you'd ever want uh, from your caching service. And it's a huge improvement over what we had in .NET 8 and earlier. So thanks so much for watching. Please hit the subscribe and like buttons and I'll see you next time right here on the Code Wolf.